Welcome to uh, session 10 of the Open UK Future Leaders training um, at lunchtime today on uh, the 5th of June 2020. Um, my name is Robert Grinnells and I am the, one of the co-chairs of the Future Leaders Group of Open UK, uh, along with Katie Gibson from Bristow's. And we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. Uh, the Future Leaders Group, however, is a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, not just lawyers, uh, and includes open source software, hardware and open data. And it includes a wide range of people across technology, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding, and is both lawyers and house counsel and everyone else in the technology sector and related fields interested in legal and policy matters. Uh, we operate under the direction of the Open UK Legal and Policy Committee to bring together and develop future leaders in legal and policy matters relating to open technologies and to support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. Our group is always open to new ideas and new members, uh, whether getting involved in all of our activities, including these ones, or just dipping in and out of our various projects. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Amanda Brock, CEO of Open UK, to introduce our speaker for today. Thanks, Rob. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Keith Bergal, the CEO of the Open Invention Network. Keith is somebody who has become one of the best known speakers in open source over the last 10, 12 years as he's been CEO in OIN. But he's also uniquely placed, as well as the work he does with OIN, he is very much following the slipstream of development of open source across different sectors. And he's not just one of the best known speakers, but he's one of the most influential people across open source, working with all sorts of different companies as they start to have their engagement in the open world. Um, Keith's background, uh, as we lawyers would say, he's a failed lawyer. I'm sure he would have something different to say about it, having studied law in his academic career before seeing the light and going off to do different things, which included being a diplomat and working with Motorola. Keith, I could probably spend the full amount of the, the time we have for your presentation today introducing you, but I'm going to hand over to you to talk to us more about patent risk in an increasingly open source centric world. Thanks very much, Amanda. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, with everyone. And uh, uh, as Amanda said, I've been uh, working in open source uh, explicitly and ex uh, specifically for the last 12 years, almost 13 now, focused on building a, uh, a sense of comfort around the use of open source code, particularly the core code that we all rely on, to ensure that uh, there's freedom of action, freedom to operate. And I've had the pleasure of uh, serving a number of different companies who had the foresight uh, uh, 15 years ago in setting up OIN, Open Invention Network, with the idea being that, uh, that it was going to be necessary uh, to uh, deal with patent risk uh, in an anticipatory fashion by uh, having an organization in place that uh, would uh, would create clearance for uh, and an opportunity space for individuals and companies seeking to develop around uh, open source platforms and projects and seeking to employ and adopt open source code. Uh, I think for everyone uh, in the community, uh, it's not a surprise, but for uh, many people that uh, live on the edges of the community or don't really understand the world in which uh, they're participating in terms of where the technology comes from and how software-centric we've become uh, as a society. And I, I emphasize as a global society, this is not a, a, a U.S.-based activity or a U.S.-based community that we're supporting. Um, really uh, very much a global approach and uh, uh, global emphasis. Um, every electronic touch that we have in the uh, uh, in the in, in really the G10 countries and beyond is enabled by open source. It's not branded as such, and uh, you obviously many people know the name Linux in the broader community. Uh, but uh, but uh, as individuals uh, go about their day, whether you're utilizing a Chromebook, which is one of the most disruptive, quietly disruptive uh, products uh, in the last 12 years uh, to be introduced, uh, making a very big impact on the whole notion of, uh, of web browsing and providing devices that people need and just what they need rather than, uh, than devices that, uh, that provide, that are overkill in terms of their functionality. 
uh, self-driving vehicles or run uh, all the testing work uh, and, and all the implementations that are done eventually in uh, commercial environments will be based on Linux and open source uh, code. Uh, obviously, all the searches that we do, no matter what platform we use, are enabled by some form or measure of, of open source code. Uh, social networking, uh, every interaction we have over chat uh, is open source code is present. Even if it's a proprietary platform that you're chatting on, uh, it's much like uh, mobile phones. Uh, smartphones, uh, whether it's uh, a curated platform that's an open source platform like Android, uh, which runs on the Linux kernel, or a platform like iOS uh, from Apple that runs not on the Linux kernel, but it utilizes the, the, the code that's inside the device uh, is, uh, is very significantly uh, Linux, uh, a, a significant amount of it. Uh, the cloud, whether it's the Amazon cloud, the Google cloud, uh, Azure, all the, the, the cloud applications in the world run on Linux or an open source. The lights that we cross at when we, uh, when we cross streets, the air traffic control systems that uh, uh, preserve our freedom to uh, to be able to fly safely. Uh, every ATM machine in the world, all the the trading platforms uh, uh, for stock uh, and commodities uh, run on Linux, uh, and uh, it's a it's a phenomenon that uh, I think for a lot of people they take for granted. But uh, when you stop and look around and realize that. The, the world is very much influenced by open source. I think it's quite comforting uh, because open source is, is about the idea of collaborative development. There's a social component because it's very much a social movement that happens to produce technology. It's the idea that one plus one plus one doesn't equal three, but it equals six or 10 or 20 when we bring smart people together and we allow them to solve problems in, in uh, together in software. And so this movement toward, toward software has been an inexorable march over the last 30, 30 year plus years. And we're seeing now that expand into open hardware. And so it's a very welcoming uh, effort in that it enables this distilled collective intelligence to be brought to bear, bear to be able to create and drive innovation uh, in a way that was not possible when we had uh, siloed uh, technology development. Uh, an important element, as I mentioned earlier, this whole notion of, of collaborative and global. Uh, it's not about uh, one country. It's not about the one group of countries. Uh, it's about providing access and providing an opportunity space for people to create and be inventive uh, together around the world uh, through open source projects and platforms and distributions. Uh, and another important element of this, uh, this global reach of open source is the contributor diversity, and it drives more inventiveness. And the, the, the whole notion that we don't have people from one company with one mindset that are, that are charting our, our technology future, but rather we have contributors from all around the world, from small companies, large companies, uh, from uh, the garages to, uh, to some of the largest steel and glass towers in the world. Uh, what's happened as a result of this is that we're getting much higher levels of innovation. When I started with OIN 12 to 13 years ago, we, uh, Linux was largely in the, uh, in the enterprise. And uh, I think at that point, uh, it was only a glimmer in someone's eyes, the eye that, uh, that gave them hope that, uh, that Linux would expand as, as, uh, as it has. And so much of the, uh, uh, of the, as I point out uh, earlier, pointed out earlier, so much of the world has been influenced by this, this drive toward, toward open source code. And whether it's the company ad adoption, uh, the first billion dollar investment that uh, IBM made was, was way back in 99, uh, shows you that how long this has been coming. Uh, and uh, now more recently, you see Microsoft uh, recognizing their interdependencies and recognizing that they cannot continue to grow and innovate uh, at the level necessary um, after starting out as an adversary uh, and now recognizing that collaboration, cooperation, and participation in something larger than themselves was the only path to being able to successfully 
grow the next generation of, uh, of technology. Um, the, uh, the open source, how the how of open source development uh, is really about, I call it project-based uh, innovation, project-based collaboration. Um, we're getting together um, organizations like the Linux Foundation, Apache, uh, many others are managing projects. This is just a sample of projects that the Linux Foundation uh, manages. Uh, of which there are hundreds that they manage and, and thousands of projects around the world uh, that are managed by all manner of, uh, of entities. Uh, and Hyperledger is blockchain. Automotive grade Linux is essentially the digital DNA of, uh, of vehicles that will transform not only the, the cabin of the future, the the info, infotainment and entertainment portion of, of the vehicle, but navigation, uh, all mission critical applications on the vehicle will all be tied to a common platform as automotive grade Linux and uh, platforms like that uh, be able to, are creating kind of this holistic uh, support structure for next generation vehicles, be they autonomous or be they uh, self-driving or uh, human driving. Uh, and so you have uh, OPNFV, you have some of the, the five to seven of the most significant uh, networking projects in the world, uh, cloud, cloud Foundry, other cloud projects uh, that exist. Uh, what this is showing is the diversity, uh, drone activity, uh, all seen, the IoT, uh, so many areas of technology uh, just recently, uh, the Linux Foundation, I think last summer, added the uh, the Aleph Energy project to focus on networks, but at different types of networks, the power grids uh, that move uh, move electricity uh, from one place to another to allow us to access it wherever we are. Um, in 1997, there was kind of an important, uh, it was an important year because uh, a, a book called The Innovator's Dilemma uh, was published, which talked about how how innovation really works, the sociology of innovation, and how ideas come from the edge and they're brought to the core uh, and then utilized, uh, and uh, how f we freshen our organizations by bringing new individuals in, sometimes by acquiring companies to be able to get the talent that we're looking for, uh, to be able to kind of change perspectives on a regular basis. And, uh, and another idea that came out was coopetition, which comes from game theory. Uh, and uh, the, this notion of, uh, of collaboration and cooperation and competition all occurring in, at the same time. It's not that you cooperate and collaborate and then, and then you go away and then, then compete. You're competing at the same time as you're collaborating and you recognize that that there's a, uh, these interdependencies that exist between companies. What I pointed out about Microsoft uh, you, is, is very much a recognition of, uh, of the, the, the notion that this distilled collective intelligence of global inventors that we're able to tap into when we collaborate, when we work together, uh, creates something special that, that we don't want to deprive ourselves our, of but rather through the social movement of open source, this idea of, of global collaboration, of, of being connected to other individuals. It doesn't matter whether they're down the street or around the world, doesn't matter whether they're, they're with your, your, your most uh, feared rival as a company or whether they're, uh, uh, they're part of your own company. Uh, the whole idea is to create something that could not be created at a pace and a, and a cycle time that uh, that it w was previously uh, unattainable, and so this there's an emerging understanding as companies start filing patents. If that's the path that they choose, they recognize that filing in the core is not a sustainable path because you're you're breaching essentially uh, a, the social compact of of how we participate in this community. The open source is really about opportunity and obligation. Uh, I think a lot of people who first come into it look at it as, a, as an opportunity to be able to uh, shrink cycle times and to be able to access creative, creative code that they don't have to, to develop on their own and something that they can build on and augment. Uh, and so uh, that, uh, that idea is, is obviously at the core of open source, but 
on the other side of it, there's obligation. It's how we behave toward each other, how we utilize that code, the recognition that we give to the inventor of the code uh, when we, and, and how, what our obligations are in, in terms of contributing back if we build on top of that code. Uh, there's a set of, of, of uh, kind of legal agreements, social agreements that exist around how our participation works and what we need to do in order to be a good citizen uh, of this community. And so this, this whole process of, of, of patenting has really been, been uh, modified and, uh, and, for, and there's a forced adjustment uh, where patenting is largely occurring in the application layers high in the stack and, uh, and lower in the stack in the core functionality uh, that comes out of major projects or minor projects, uh, we're seeing less and less filing, which is a good thing because people are understanding uh, their obligation. Their obligation is to, uh, is to allow for technology that's considered core that comes out of projects to be utilized freely without fear of litigation. And that's, a, that's, that's part of what OIN has been doing is, is really instilling within uh, this community of uh, millions of people who are developing around open source platforms every day the understanding of, of if they chose to file patents, where it's acceptable to file patents, uh, and where you only file where you can gain differentiation. That's one of the key things that, that a lot of people have, have not understood for many years because there are lots of, of patents that are, that are not necessary, uh, that don't support differentiation, don't support products in the market, uh, and are, uh, uh, are not useful. And so we see many, many companies going through their portfolios with the advent of open source and its, uh, its diffusion <clears throat> into so many different application areas. <coughs> Excuse me. We see this movement of, uh, of individuals and people uh, <clears throat> uh, in companies uh, moving to the point where they're recognizing uh, the the, the, the nature of open source, the nature of this opportunity and obligation, the idea that we cooperate to compete more effectively, and the fact that this is a social movement, um, which is an irreversible movement uh, that affects the way that we invent now and out, out into the future. The, the key for a lot of people um, inside companies, and one of the challenges in uh, in traditional companies that have had long histories of uh, of patenting, is that they they have kind of lived with this idea that uh, that it's it's either open or closed, that they live in a proprietary world, and so the mindset has shifted not only for technologists, and their their mindset shifted a lot faster than than the legal legal teams which support supported them for many years and continue to support them. Uh, and that mindset is now recognizing that that the uh, this idea of coopetition, collaborative development is embodied in open source software and doesn't signal the demise of intellectual property. It just means that we change where we invent and where we where we create freedom of action and freedom to operate. Because everyone, if if we recognize that everyone needs to utilize the core code that's being produced from projects we recognize that we need to create a no-fly zone around those assets, which is really what OIN uh, was premised on when it was formed and, and what its mission is on a daily basis. And so OIN is part of a community solution for patent risk mitigation. It's about companies coming together uh, as they have in many different activities to be able to reduce risk associated with patents, uh, to be able to, to encourage collaboration, encourage innovation, uh, and not to discourage participation uh, of one community or group. And these are just a list, <clears throat> along with OIN, uh, Allied Security Trust, uh, RPX, these are entities that were created to, to deal with, uh, specifically with uh, uh, patent troll risk, uh, the owners of, uh, of patents that don't, don't utilize those patents to support products, uh, and are non-practicing entities uh, and decide to become serial asserters. Uh, they don't create any value in the community. Rather, they just look to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to create uh, a taxing system or rents in the form of uh, settlements or, or licensing fees. 
that diminish rather than uh, than accentuate or advance. Unified Patents is a company that uh, focuses in the U.S. primarily, uh, but also increasingly in Europe through the opposition system to be able to uh, limit the effect of poor quality patents by having them declared invalid uh, through a system that's that exists in in the U.S. and as I said, to some degree in Europe. Lot Network is uh, an anti-privateering platform uh, that was spawned by Google uh, maybe six years ago. It's been very successful in its early going, uh, and uh, and includes uh, literally hundreds of companies that agree that they will not engage in privateering, i.e., they will not sell their patents to a third party and then uh, and then have those patents be uh, used as weapons. Uh, against uh, members of their own community or other communities in which they might participate. Uh, looking more closely now at what OIN is and what it does, uh, it was established in 05, as I said previously. Uh, it's uh, it, in addition to IBM, Red Hat, at the time Novell, but Suse. Philips, Sony, and NEC, which were the original companies, Google and Toyota have become participants in the community uh, in 13 and 2013 and 2016, respectively. Uh, and uh, there are uh, all these companies are uh, they the the first six were incredibly uh, prophetic uh, and uh, and and really. Uh, acting in a way that was selfless and responsible because they recognized how important open source was and what a, a uh, discontinuity it, rec it, it represented. Uh, and so Google and Toyota came in later recognizing the need to continue to support this activity and this work and to be able to specifically enable the advancement of uh, patent non-aggression uh, into uh, key technology areas like mobility, computing, uh, and the auto sector uh, specifically. Uh, right now, uh, OIN is the largest patent on aggression community in the history of technology. Uh, 3,200 plus companies have gotten together and counting uh, from startups to some of the largest corporations in the world to support the general notion that where we collaborate uh, and where we rely on each other on, on, a, on, a, on the core code that we produce in the projects that we participate in, that we shouldn't sue each other. It's a very simple concept, and it's done, it's implemented through a license. Uh, the pool of, comp of patents that are owned by the companies, the 3,200 plus companies that are part of the community, is in excess of 3 million right now. So that's 3 million patents that are subject to a cross license. Uh, where patents that are rele relevant to the core of Linux and open source, relevant to what we call the Linux system definition, those patents are cross-licensed to all other participants in the community. Uh, and again, it's this this community ethic. What happens in the in in OIN is really just mirroring what happens in the open source community on a daily basis, where individuals are collaborating uh, together. Uh, from a technology standpoint, this is a legal collaboration, a community of collaboration where individuals recognize their obligations. Again, back to that notion of opportunity and obligation. This is an obligation to be able to participate and be authentic within the community uh, so that, that you send a message to, to other, pl other players in the community that, with whom you participate in projects that you are, you accept certain norms, certain codes of conduct and behaviors. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we currently uh, own 1,300 uh, plus patents and applications with very broad scope. They don't cover just Linux, they cover many different technology areas. They were purchased largely to serve as a deterrent to companies that, that would uh, be uh, patent antagonists. Uh, very early on, uh, it's no secret that OIN was formed to thwart the, uh, the negative intentions uh, of uh, Microsoft and a number of other companies who were openly antagonistic to Linux and were threatening to utilize patents to slow or stall the progress of open source more broadly. Uh, and so uh, that world has changed. Uh, 18 months ago, um, 
Microsoft became a participant in the OIN community, which is uh, some form of, uh, of manifest destiny. Um, I, when I, from my first conversation uh, 11 years ago with Microsoft about OIN, uh, I talked about it, <clears throat> its inevitability because as open source becomes more relevant to any company, <clears throat> there's a, uh, <clears throat> a need for, uh, for participation. There's a need for utilization. Uh, and there's a need to become authentic within the community that you now participate. Uh, we spent over $100 million acquiring these patents and make them available on a royalty-free basis. <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, Linux system, which is what we, as I described, the considered to be the core areas of coverage, the patent no-fly zone. The scope of this is made up of uh, core Linux technology, uh, Linux and, and adjacent open source technology packages, uh, and many, many different projects are, uh, are supported uh, in terms of uh, where we draw the technologies from. It's important to understand, as I said at the outset, that uh, uh, OIN is very much uh, by design a global organization. Uh, and if you look at this, you think, well, looks like it's more America, you know, more US focused, but uh, the America's number I'll break down for you. Um, we're very proud of how, um, how Asian companies in particular over the last 15 years have responded uh, uh, into open source. But typically there's a parallel between what happens in open source and uh, and the movement toward participation in the OIN community. As companies participate in open source more, they become participants in the OIN community uh, and participants in the cross-license that it supports. Uh, the number 22% is, is quite significant from where it came from uh, in terms of uh, just 10 years ago, we only had uh, six or 7% of our, our community came from uh, from Asia Asia Pacific uh, but uh, it's uh, it's it's clearly evidence that of the success of the people who are managing projects and the projects that they've spawned that uh, you have so many Asian participants now in OIN uh, this gives you a good sense of uh, the growth in in South and Central America has been quite significant uh, over the last five years we've gone from two uh, percent of representation, global representation in that region to now 18%. Uh, North America is very balanced at 24%. Uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa is our largest region with 35% and Asia Pacific with 23%. So we've been striving for this global balance and, uh, and we're very happy to see the responses of, of companies around the world to make this truly the kind of global organization, global community that we we're hoping for. This gives you an indication of, of uh, if you look at, uh, at this, you see in 14, uh, 2014 to 2015, the year 2015, you saw a, a, an exponential growth in open source project participation, uh, not just by Huawei in China that's been participating in open source projects going back to the early part of the decade, but it was a, it was a, a compact between the government and companies that open source was a positive vehicle to be able to support global, global participation in the innovation process by Chinese companies. And you saw many, many companies, Ali, Tencent, Baidu, uh, 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 the, the mobile companies, China Mobile, the, uh, the payments companies, WeChat Pay, Alipay, all of these companies starting to, to rush to, the, to utilize open source and to participate in open source projects. And at the same time, you saw participation in OIN uh, rise during that year. And the growth has been significant since then. Uh, this is just an example of the kinds of companies from China that are part of the community. Uh, China admittedly has been the last to the show uh, in terms of participation in open source uh, in Asia. Uh, it started with uh, very significant investments and participation in projects by the Japanese companies during the latter part of the last decade, uh, and then Korean companies uh, quick, shortly afterward. Uh, and now, as I said, since the middle of this decade, 
uh, we've seen a major movement of auto companies, uh, electronics companies, uh, some of the largest companies in the world uh, participating in, uh, in open source and in OIN at the same time. Gives you an example of the representation of how companies uh, across the uh, different technology areas are participants. And you see the kind of global take on, on com where, the, the, where these companies are coming from, the size of these companies, the, the, uh, the number. You look at the automotive sector. There are very few auto companies that are not part of OIN and that are not participating in open source. Um, and so uh, this growth has been, uh, has been uh, incredible. And uh, it's really a testament to how important open source is and then how OIN is very much a companion element when you participate in an open source project, open source is relevant to you, you should be participating in this global community and sharing the, the, uh, the, the burden and the obligation of, uh, of neutralizing patent risk in the core where we all uh, are active. Uh, just another example, as we look at some additional industries, you look at industrials, uh, I remember my first discussion with Caterpillar and with the uh, the Japanese companies that, that are also part of our community that participate from this space. And you see so much be going on in, in companies that, that were very much uh, you know, software averse almost for many, many years of their history. And software is becoming increasingly important uh, in so many different industries. And because of that, open source is becoming uh, very, uh, very, very much uh, center of, of attention and the vehicle for innovation in software. Uh, to give, briefly give you a sense of the scope of the cross license, you look on the on the right. You see Python, you see GNOME, uh, SUSE, you know, they're Google. There's so many different projects. Uh, uh, the OpenStack cloud project. Uh, so many different projects in addition to the kernel that we're protecting, that we're, we're essentially, we have a technical committee. They, we work with a technical advisory council made up of a dozen external companies uh, to be able to ensure that we're looking uh, at, uh, at what is truly core in the major projects and, uh, and understanding how that, uh, how that core code should be, uh, should be essentially protected from patent risk so that individuals can utilize it uh, without fear. Uh, and essentially, most of what we have in Linux system definition are common base packages, software engineering, the, in the enterprise, mobility, network and security, the cloud, the web, uh, and, and several other areas. Uh, as new technologies emerge, uh, new code is developed through projects. Uh, core code is designated uh, by the technical leads of those projects. We, had, we look at that core code, evaluate its usage, and once it's used and being adopted <clears throat> in a significant way, we then include that code in, in the Linux system definition. <clears throat> As I said earlier, we partner with organizations like the Linux Foundation. Uh, we are involved in, in technical development, <clears throat> that in, in supporting technical development, through this collaboration, uh, this legal collaboration, which is again a parallel universe, we look at being this, having this guardian role in supporting major projects. Obviously, Linux is the most significant open source project in the world, uh, but we look at Android, Chrome, OpenStack, uh, uh, container initiatives uh, that exist, Kubernetes, obviously. Uh, automotive grade Linux, the networking projects, o ONAP and OPNFV being just a couple of them, Hyperledger and uh, blockchain code and LF Energy and, and, the, and the promise of, of the transformative effect of, uh, of bringing open source software into, the, uh, into our energy networks. Uh, and <clears throat> what, we're, what we're doing is, as I said earlier, is, is Distilled to its essence, what we're doing is building community, building this global community of companies and individuals that have the same values and norms around how you use patents in this, in, as the world becomes more, more software centric, more open source centric. Uh, in terms of how people participate, everyone can join, it's free. There's no cost to anything that OIN does. Uh, I've talked about this cross license in this community. Participation in that is free. Um, that's the magic of this and why I talk about 
the original six companies plus Google and Toyota is having incredible foresight, recognizing the, that putting something together like this was going to take uh, an, an effort and a commitment of capital and time to be able to get it right, to be able to create a community that whether you are the most uh, patent-centric organization in the world in terms of developing patents and having some of our companies have that are in our community have in excess of 60,000 patents. <clears throat> some of our companies have no patents and individuals who participate and are anti-patent. The, the, the elegance of the OIN model that was developed by these, these companies at its founding is that it's not about uh, generating profit. It's not about creating uh, a lever to be able to force people to participate in the community. It's about giving people an opportunity to, to, to manage their, their, their patent activities in concert with, with their open source participation to deal with the duality that's, that's part and parcel of, of what it takes now to participate in the technology space uh, effectively where software is involved. Uh, we do other things um, in addition to, uh, to maintaining the cross license and, and reducing risk in the core of Linux and, open, and adjacent open source technology. We collect and share prior art uh, we worked with uh, GNOME. Some of you uh, are aware that two weeks ago, uh, GNOME and its council did a a, 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 a great job of uh, of managing litigation from a serial litigant, one of those patent trolls that I talked about earlier, a non-practicing entity that uh, typically looks to sue, collect small fees from dozens of, if not hundreds of companies, uh, to be able to, uh, it creates disruption in the market. It does not provide a, a, a benefit to innovation uh, and, and imposes a rent or a tax through licensing. Uh, and instead of uh, settling at a very low level, which they could have, they essentially were able to negotiate a very successful uh, blanket uh, protection for the entire community. Uh, so kudos to them, uh, their outside counsel, the relationships that were developed with outside counsel, um, and how outside counsel worked with uh, with the foundation. Uh, I think it's a, an excellent example of uh, of uh, of how legal resources can be brought to bear. Uh, our role was to support by providing prior art to their counsel, so that they could more effectively negotiate. <clears throat> and we try and do that on a regular basis. We have at least a dozen companies right now that we're providing prior art to that we're helping to deal with uh, with patent risk. Um, we sell patents to, and um, we've sold on a number of occasions, to companies at risk or in litigation to help them deal with, uh, discourage patent litigation or allow them to deal with it by counterclaiming against the companies that were, uh, were suing them uh, for patent infringement. And so, uh, our patents are purely for defensive purposes. We only sell them with lots of uh, restrictions that ensure that they can never be used against the community or individuals developing technology uh, in support of the community. Um, we acquire patents from patent antagonists. In certain cases, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've cleared patents by uh, taking them from non-practicing entities so that they couldn't be used against the community through serial litigation. Uh, in other cases, um, we're we're doing uh, uh, pre-issuance work, which is something through the American Vents Act in the U.S. We work to uh, uh, review patent applications on a daily basis. Uh, actually, every week they come out on Tuesday. We review the uh, the patent applications that come out, and then uh, provide prior art to the patent examiners. So that uh, patent scope can be the claims claim scope can be reduced, or the patent application can be can be rejected in its entirety, uh, and uh, and then uh, very often we file in those spaces to ensure that we're creating clearance uh, in a, in a particular space because all the patents that we own are shared on a royalty free basis with every one of our our community participants. Uh, and so we've purchased patents uh, on a number of occasions, as I said, to clear risk in open source software. Uh, our sales, uh, as I discussed, 
and and really membership alone is 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 a deterrent they getting companies to participate and having companies like like hitachi fujitsu toshiba lg alibaba uh uh tencent uh at&t uh ibm uh philips sony some of the largest patent holding companies in the world and companies, many of many of on that list have been very successful in monetizing their their intangible assets, their IP, to be able to create additional income. Uh, that this what OIM does is by having all these companies participate shows that that you can deal with this duality. You can still, if you choose to, develop patent portfolios. You can utilize those portfolios. You can license those portfolios. Uh, you can do what you want with patents that don't relate to Linux and the and core core Linux and, and, and adjacent open source technology. Uh, but in the core of Linux, as we define by the Linux system definition, it's not uh, acceptable uh, and not possible once you sign the OIN license to use those patents uh, against anyone who is in is also in the community. So we've done a, a variety of things uh, in terms of claim scope reduction. I think we are the largest participant, most significant participant in that program uh, in the in the U.S. And we've also engaged uh, just last year. We got together with uh, uh, the Linux Foundation, but also with IBM and Microsoft uh, to be able to uh, uh, support an activity with an entity called Unified Patents that I mentioned earlier, where poor quality patents held by non-practicing entities uh, can be uh, can be uh, uh, neutralized, and so those patents can be uh, invalidated, uh, and uh, and 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 uh, in that manner, we're reducing risk not only from operating companies by through our cross license, but also through non-practicing from non-practicing entities that are routinely involved in creating, again, uh, non-accretive disruption uh, in, communi in communities and technology spaces. Uh, and really what we've done is establish patent non-aggression as a cultural norm in Linux and open source. And the only companies that don't join uh, OIN at the end of the day are either companies for whom open source is not relevant, of which there are fewer and fewer every day, uh, or companies that want to reserve the right to sue on core Linux and open source code. And uh, and that's a shrinking number of companies as well, because there are very few companies that can employ individuals that are talented software developers uh, um, if they if they do have that, uh, that lack of authenticity. Um, and so uh, we're growing, we're, we're doing our part for this, uh, this elegant, uh, expanding world of open source, and uh, it's been my my pleasure and my honor to uh, to lead OIN and to serve as a guardian of uh, of really what it what is a a way of life uh, for for technology the technology community and for technologists. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. Thanks very much, Keith. Um, I know Terence had some questions. I may have answered in the thread. Uh, Terence works with uh, NHSX, and they are actually a licensee. Keith, I don't know if you remember that. Terence, did right. you have a specific question for Keith today? Hi there. Um, I was just uh, interested if it was possible to search the of all the patents that OIN have. I, I saw there's a, a sort of big list of them, but obviously that's uh, not necessarily as easy as finding which one. I might yeah, we, we can, um, what we're doing is updating the website so that you'll be able to, by uh, general category like mobility, uh, security, uh, e-commerce, you'll be able to search through that kind of mechanism to be able to sort and sift through the 1300 patents to make it a bit easier uh, if you're looking for something in a specific technology area. And that should be done in the next uh, six weeks. Thank you, that's very helpful. And we're also doing something like that with the Linux system definition. Uh, with the pack, now that we have uh, 2,800, soon to have 3,000 packages in the Linux system definition, 
uh, being able to go through and understand what's there uh, is something that we've been working on. So we've we've uh, we've developed a tool that allows you to do that as well, which will be coming online at the same time. If many of the people that are on this call or who will watch the video are in our future leaders group and they're people who have a, an amount of experience or interest in open source, they're probably not developers, although some are. They're probably the people who are in the, the support functions who will be doing Andrew Katz and my job when we're long retired, I hope, and we're making sure that they're getting the right experience and understanding to become those leaders of tomorrow in their specific areas and supporting the open communities. One of the things I picked up on you saying today was opportunity and obligation being at the core of open source. And in my personal experience of dealing with companies coming to open, they often understand the opportunity. It doesn't take a lot to persuade them of all the values and benefits of open. But sometimes getting them to understand that obligation piece is a bit harder and to get them over the line to being good citizens in the open community. Could you talk a little bit more about that and your experiences working with companies in that way? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely. I think it's, uh, it is it is the value proposition of adopting code and not having to recreate it and being able to build on someone else's ideas. I think people uh, quickly take to that. Um, but in terms of obligation, a lot of people, it's almost like we're, you know, our, we're in the you know, from the U.S. It's hard not to uh, to uh, to observe what's going on, uh, and uh, you know, it's much like citizenship in a society. Uh, you're part of a country. You have you have an opportunity. The U.S., for example, I think is a, provides a great opportunity for technology development, for startups, for for individuals to to participate in the economy. Um, but we also have obligations. We have social, moral, legal obligations. Um, and uh, I think it's sometimes we forget what those are. Uh, and that's, uh, that's unfortunate, uh, whether we're citizens of a society or of a community like, uh, like open source. And I think what, we, what I've always emphasized is, is this, this point of obligation. And we're... Um, we're very good at uh, at uh, self-organization uh, and that that first part of working together to collaborate. It's a, it's such a natural thing, uh, and it has these immense global impacts because it's bringing people together in ways that 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 uh, I think governments are not sometimes very good at doing. Uh, and so it's 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 an, it's an incredible uh, contagion of of collaboration, uh, to use another word that's uh, in, the, uh, in the, the common vernacular on a daily basis. Uh, we've come together, <clears throat> and I'd say I've seen every five years that I've been in, in, in almost five-year increments, more and more companies recognizing the obligation. One of the, the reasons, the Microsoft discussion, uh, when they were ready to sign the OIN license, they called me into a meeting. And they said, yeah, we, we want to do this. And it's, it's, this is a Tasha Nadella decision, a CTO decision, a uh, John Gossman decision. These are the kind of people who influenced it. The, the senior leadership of the company uh, clearly was implemented by the legal group and, and uh, the due diligence was done by legal and, uh, and IP. But um, this is the, the what was explained to me and which was was really telling because it was almost as if as if that's why I use the term manifest destiny. What what we've accomplished is what we set out to accomplish. And um, we're not settling for some, you know, kind of minor component of value uh, or re revisiting, remaking, you know, kind of our mission. Um, we've gotten the company to recognize that. They needed to be part of a community, and that's what they explicitly told me, that from the CEO on down, they recognized that they needed to be authentic within the community. They needed to be a participant, to be able to hire the best people, to be able to retain the best people. They needed to recognize their obligation. And I think this is a journey that if, if Microsoft can make that journey and recognize that it, it, it needs to participate it needs to understand this co-opetition that it's part of in the global global context uh, if they can do it other companies can do it 
and I've seen this, it's, it's like a coming of wisdom or coming of age mm -hmm. for individuals and, commu and, and different parts of the community. Uh, the Chinese companies, uh, in the beginning, very little contribution was coming from Chinese companies. Now, Huawei is actually a sig very significant contributor back uh, to the projects in which it participates. Um, and a lot of people don't, don't really look at that, don't understand that, but we can expect that Alibaba and, uh, uh, and Tencent, Tencent in several of its projects is a top 10 contributor. Um, and this has happened very quickly. So I would say that the social norm of, of participation and community involvement and the obligations that we have are starting to become much more prescient to these companies. And part of the reason is because individuals, it's not just millennials, but anyone who's working at these companies has an expectation and makes an expectation, imposes an expectation and a burden on, on the individual leaders of the companies in which they're participating. You know, you see the, the, uh, the, what happened with Facebook earlier in the week. Um, individuals who are in these companies are not afraid to make demands uh, and one of the demands they're making is that, that they, these companies behave in a certain way, that they recognize their obligation, obligation to society and obligation to this community within society that is so important and, and so significant in terms of supporting technology development. What you say there is interesting. So I remember the, the journey to open from Microsoft and the, bringing them over the line to sign up took about nine years, if I remember rightly. What we see with the Asian country, companies is very different, right? They, they're coming to OIN and coming to that commitment of um, obligation as well as opportunity much, much quicker from what I'm seeing. Is that right? Yeah, no, it, it is. I mean, you've got intense pragmatism uh, that drives the behaviors and you have growing portfolios, but still relatively small global portfolios relative to the large companies, uh, significant tech companies of the U.S., Europe, uh, uh, Japan, and Korea, um, where uh, you know it's not unusual to have 10 or 20,000 patents, or you know, like Canon, I think has 80,000 patents. Uh, these are very significant companies, and so if you want to participate in these communities and you want to do so without fear of litigation and be part of a community, that's the other thing. You want to thread yourself into a community. Very, very few. In fact, I, I know of only one situation where one member of our of the 32 hundred plus companies, where one member of the community sued another member of the community. It wasn't on open source grounds, but it's it's very unusual for any litigation to occur when you're part of the same community and threaded together, and your belief system is linked together. And so that's another byproduct of participation in a community like OIN and recognizing your obligations. When you're setting yourself up as a model of positive behavior, uh, you are then you then kind of become less uh, less of a of an unknown. Your your culture you're creating a cultural bond, and so we encourage companies to talk to each other on a regular basis if there is some technology that they want to license, and encourage fair and reasonable licensing terms if if that's what a company wants to do uh, to participate in the technology space. I find it interesting that the Asian companies seem to have more perception around that than many of the Europeans in a similar boat without the great big patent pools that the US companies have, or patent portfolios, I should say, that the, the US companies have. The Asians really seem to have understood that need for integration more. Um, I know we've got another question from Andrew Katz. Andrew, do you want to ask your question to Keith? Um, yeah, th fantastic. Um, Keith, thank you very much indeed for that. Very, very interesting. Um, I I've got um, two questions, if, if that's OK. Um, so uh, the first one is pretty specific and the second one is a bit more general. Um, so the first one is one that comes up um, from clients from time to time uh, when I'm uh, talking about OIN. Um, and they say, oh, yeah, well, we're using a lot of um, technologies that are in the Linux system definition, so that would be useful for us. Uh, but then, but, but we're not necessarily using Linux, so it could be because of containerization or, or some number of other reasons. Um, so, um, uh, how do you respond to that? What, what sort of coverage do people get in those circumstances? Yeah, I mean that's why. I mean, I think it's a, it's kind of like uh, the world has moved on. I, I talk to Jim Zemlin about this periodically. The Linux Foundation. Well, it's really well beyond Linux. It's just yeah. like the Linux system definition we've moved beyond simply Linux. 
I mean, Linux is obviously the the kernel was the foundation around which mm -hmm. which the first 1,100 packages were were incorporated into this cross license zone uh, to create the zone. But we we have lots of Apache code. We have code from many different projects that are unrelated to Linux. So we're we're just right now we'll be announcing uh, an update to Linux system definition. will uh, in the in late summer. And we're just finalizing it, but we'll be including Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop can can operate independent of Linux, uh, and we have lots of mm -hmm. code like that that is open source code that's enabling, but isn't necessarily. Uh, I mean, Kubernetes is is being included as well. Uh, so we have lots of code that uh, that individuals are, that are utilizing any form of open source. Uh, we'll 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 ultimately get to protect. The core of of every major project in the world yep. as we continue to grow. So it's it's a it's a it's a legacy of where open source was, with Linux being the kind of most significant project that people thought about 15 years ago when OIN was architected. But really, it's an open source zone, uh, just like Zemlin has, has changed his events to be open source summits. Not Linux, uh, Linux cons the way they were, you know, just five years ago. Mm -hmm. Andrew, no, before you excellent. ask your other question, yeah. it might just be worth mentioning for anybody listening or watching the video. There is a really useful publication from the Linux Foundation. I think it's co-authored by Armin Hemmel, talking about containerization and the legal issues and licensing issues around using open source in that. So I, I would recommend that. Mike Dolan of the Linux Foundation has shared it extensively. You can probably find it on their site and definitely in his posts and LinkedIn. So Andrew, do you want to ask your second question? Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, and Keith, no, thank you for that answer. It's very reassuring because that's essentially what I've been telling people. So it's nice to nice to know that I haven't been talking nonsense. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, the second one is is related, and I, I think as, as you know, I've got a particular interest in open hardware, um, and more generally, I'd be interested in your thoughts on um, how the work of the OIN might extend into the hard, hardware world, either in the sort of short, medium, or long terms. Yeah, that's a very uh, timely question. Um, we have uh, we've started to explore uh, whether the there's sufficient elasticity within uh, uh, the Linux system definition and within the OIN mission to accommodate uh, what I consider to be some level of software embedded in silicon uh, and uh, you know, the the Risk five to me is a, is a revolution, mm -hmm. um, and it's perhaps one of the most significant areas for a discontinuity in in terms of how we how we go to silicon. And uh, it's been a gating factor for many many years. And the ability to look at open hardware, uh, risk five being kind of the 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 what I look at as as one of the leading initiatives. Uh, the Risk Five project and other activities that are going on. So we, uh, uh, I would say that uh, that we will carefully consider over the next uh, 18 months um, uh, whether uh, whether Risk Five should be included and and whether the notion of including cores um that are uh, that we want people to be able to utilize at will without fear of litigation that if we can inoculate um uh participants in in uh, in this in the community uh producing de designing developing uh um uh next generation silicon that uh if we can inoculate them from patent risk uh i think we will have uh, done a very important thing and uh, so uh, we are evaluating it. Um, as I said, it's very timely because I've probably been spending more time looking, talking to companies like Western Digital and, and Google and Alibaba and uh, and Sci Five and uh, uh, and uh, a low risk at Cambridge. Uh, they're large and small companies alike to, uh, to better understand how we might be able to do this. Um, there's, there's. It's not clear that we will be able to do it inside OIN, but one way or another, it's something that I'm deeply committed to: yep. is ensuring that that there is a protection zone around the Risk Five, so that it uh, 
it's the, those who are adopting can feel comfortable can feel the same comfort that people who adopt the Linux kernel can feel. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think, no, thank you. Um, Open UK is probably the first organization to specifically state that it, it focuses not just on software, but hardware and data in the open space as well and open technologies. We'll be hosting an open hardware day as part of Open UK week, week of the 19th of October, Keith. So we may well ask you to, to come along and participate in that now that everything's been done digitally. Um, Katie, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Great. Just to thank you so much again, Keith, for your time and for giving such an interesting presentation. Um, no, next, my pleasure. <laughs> um, next week, we have Neil McGovern discussing the history of Open. So hopefully to see, you can see as many people as possible there next week. Thank you. We may even have some more insights into the GNOME Foundation and the patent litigation. Keith, you may want to join us if you're up early. Thanks very much for getting up so early and see everybody next week. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.